Welcome to Hoko Polizzo's The Writing Life. My name is Michael Collier, and I'm here with Elizabeth Spires and David Yezzi, and we're going to read uh, a few poems uh, and then have a conversation with ourselves. And Beth, do you, do you want to start? One of the ideas we had was that we would um, read a poem and then talk about perhaps its origin and how it relates to the idea of uh, the wonder, the wonder moments of wonder that lead us uh, to writing poems. Okay, thanks, Mike. Um, I'm going to read the title poem of my new book. We all have new books. And this book is Asian-inspired. And it's also thinking a lot about the title of the book is A Memory of the Future. Uh, the ti that's the title poem here. And um, it's thinking a lot about what's going to happen in the years ahead. And it, I mean, I was also thinking about what's been happening to people I was close to and the generation above me mm -hmm. as they lost parts of their memory. So, uh, memory of the future. I will say tree, not pine tree. I will say flower, not forsythia. I will see birds, many birds, flying in four directions. Then rock and cloud will be lost. Spring will be lost. And most terribly, your name will be lost. I will revel in a world no longer particular, a world made vague as if by fog, but not fog. Vaguely aware, I will wander at will. I will wade deeper into wide water. You'll see me there, out by the horizon, an old gray thing who finally knows gray is the most beautiful color. And I think I was thinking a lot about retrieving. We were talking earlier amongst ourselves about this business of retrieving names and words and how things get less specific. So, yeah. Uh, and I think you have a poem, David, don't you? I do. Um, this uh, um, is a sort of an elegy, um, sort of a dual elegy um, about. Um, someone that I knew um, sort of distantly, and then someone I didn't know at all. <laughs> um, uh, and um, it was prompted by, um, shortly after the news of um, uh, Prince's death, the musician mm -hmm. Prince. It's called uh, Dying the Day Prince Died, and it kind of goes from the title into the poem. Dying the day Prince died is the opposite of being born on the same day as, say, Marie Curie, or Bach, or even Prince for that matter, or the artist formerly known as the artist <laughs> formerly known as Prince, now just Prince, as he will forever be known. Too bad I never met him. You I met, a few times as a matter of fact, but you never remembered my ever meeting you. Memory's a tricky thing, and so I forgive you. Who am I, after all, just a person with a pulse? A pulse is good, particularly from your perspective, I'd imagine. The internet is burning up with the news of Prince's death, almost literally on fire with the heat generated by his solo on the all-star While My Guitar Gently Weeps at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. At the end, instead of a mic drop, Prince throws his guitar up in the air. And as far as we're concerned, watching it on YouTube, it never comes down. A guitar chariot of flame, its stained ash body somewhere becoming spirit. I'm not sure where you died or how exactly. 
I'd heard of it through friends. You had been ill. There hasn't been a whole lot in the press. It's possible that I missed it, that we missed it. We've all been so distracted by the passing of Prince, by our wish to be purified again in the waters of Lake Minnetonka, by the terror of a father's drunken rage, by laughter and the rhythmic click of boots walking in lamplit rain. Um, and so I think what kind of occurred to me, I was watching, I came across this clip uh, of Prince playing the guitar. And first of all, the guitar playing was so amazing, but then there's this weird thing that happened at the end where he kind of throws his guitar up and then um, <laughs> um, you don't see what happened, apparently vanishes. And um, that was the idea, clearly that was the idea. Um, and it got me thinking, you know, I think when Prince died, a lot of people felt, I certainly did, that, you know, here was someone who, as an artist, had meant so much to me and who, you know, was a big part of my, you know, growing up and these songs I, you know, have lots of associations with and, you know, his music was, meant a lot to me, it was um, very moving. And I thought it was curious that, you know, that one could feel very deeply uh, for someone that one has never met, um, mm. doesn't know at all, and yet you feel that there's a kind of connection there. You feel that you know something about Prince, and Prince has shown you something, given you something um, that has affected you deeply. Uh, and then that compared with someone that, you know, you knew but only slightly, who you never really, really crazy about, um, and they, you know, when they die, it's a very different thing. It's also very personal in a way because you, um, you know, have actually met that person in the flesh. And yet, how strange that this person you've never mm -hmm. met means so much more. <laughs> um, I don't know what that says. It's, uh, it, you know, maybe that's not such a great thing, but it does seem to be sort of the truth. Yeah. Well, there's an intimacy in death, I think, that uh, can take you by surprise. Yeah. And uh, that, that's part of what I hear in, in that poem. Yeah. And, the, and, and that comparison of someone you knew with someone who was so well known. Yeah. Um, there, even though you didn't know the person all that well, in comparison, uh, it intensifies the relationship. You know, especially since it happened on the same day. The news comes. Right. It's, simultane it's a simultaneous event. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and I think once it happens, you know, it kind of recasts all of your feelings and thoughts and, you know, uh, about that person. All the annoyances um, uh, are kind of in a, you know, cast in a completely right. different light. Yeah. Um, and uh, uh, you have a poem that, um, uh, that you can read for us, yeah? Yeah, and, and it's, um, it's, it's an elegy as well, and it's... Uh, for someone I knew quite well. He was a, a friend and also a, a teacher of mine. It's called Last Morning with Steve Orland. Last night I wrote a Russian novel, or maybe it was English. Either way, it was long and boring. My wife's laughter might tell you which it was. And when she stops, when she's not laughing, Let's talk about the plot and its many colors. The blue that hovered in the door where the lovers held each other but didn't kiss. The red that by mistake rose in the sky with the moon and the moon-colored sun that wouldn't leave the sky. All night I kept writing it down, each word arranged in my mouth. But now, as you can see, I'm flirting with my wife. I'm making her laugh. She's 20. I'm 25. Just as we were when we met. Just as we have always been. Except for last night's novel, Russian or English, with its shimmering curtain of color, an unfading show of northern lights, what you, you might call Aurora Borealis. Sit down on the bed with my wife and me, faithful amanuensis, 
you can write down my last words. Not that they're great, but maybe they are. You wouldn't know. You're an aurora borealis. But my wife is laughing, and you're laughing too, just as we were at the beginning, just as we are at the end. So um, the wonder, I think, in that poem is just the wonder of being so close to a friend uh, who really he died two days later. Mm -hmm. And uh, he, was, he was, you know, um, heavily under morphine. And uh, the occasion for the poem, it's really a kind of transcription. Yeah. Uh, the occasion for the poem was uh, uh, his wife wanted to go uh, to the gym early in the morning. She hadn't had a break from being with him. And I was visiting, and so I said, well, I'll, I get up early, so I'll just come over. And so that was it. I went over, and I, I was about ready to knock on the door, and I could hear this laughter. Hmm. And so I just opened the door and, and went in. And uh, he and his wife were sitting on the bed, and I just said, uh, so how, and they were laughing, and I said, so how, how was your night last night, Steve? And he said, it was great. I wrote a novel. <laughs> and then he started to, <laughs> he started to talk about, uh, started to talk about that. Did he know that he dreamt it, or did he think he actually had written it? You know, he, he, th there was no better person uh, made for terminal morphine than, than Steve <laughs> Orland. Uh, um, and who knows? I'm sure it was something that he had experienced. Mm. And what had been happening uh, the day before and then the day after, it was a group of friends during the day, and we would just be around him talking with him. And he would say something, and he'd say, someone write that down, that's a great line, that's gonna be a great line. And then if you said something, uh, he said, he'd say to somebody, write Collier's line down, that's gonna be a great line in a oh, poem. Great. And you know, we were just that way together. Now, he, does he have sort of a tart word for the speaker regarding Aurora Borealis? What's that about? Well, <laughs> he, was always giving, he was always giving me a hard time because oh. he, he thought, you know, I, I grew up in a tract home neighborhood in, in Phoenix, Arizona, mm. and he always thought I took on airs. <laughs> and so it was his job, when I was, a, when I was right. a student of his, it was his job to kind of put me in my place. Right. And so that's part of what that's is, funny. is yeah, that's part right. of what's going on there. It's yeah. a lovely moment. It's very yeah. revealing of the relationship. G g giving me a hard time. And I love the humor of, I mean, it comes through. I'm sure he was funny even when it oh, wasn't was, the end. Yeah, no, he, 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 he was really funny. But, you know, it gets, it gets to that idea of the kind of intimacy that can happen when someone is dying. If, I mean, he was incredibly generous in the way he died because he allowed people to come in. Uh, and uh, the day I left, he, he, when, when all of us were, had been around, he said, this is the happiest day of my life. And, uh, and you know, I think, he, I, I think it was true, yeah. you know, because he was with his friends. He loved friends. Um, yeah, but, but the occasion for that poem really was, uh, you know, maybe three years later, I just wrote it down. Mm -hmm. I, didn't ha I didn't have to do much. Yeah. I, just had to re I just had to dramatize it a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And I think you get at one of the things that, for me, is one, truly one of the most wonderful things in life is just that sort of exuberant laughter. Uh -huh. That you would kind of come in with that and that you would go out with that. Yeah. And that you would share that, that that's what you share with friends. Yeah. Um, seems to me one of the greatest yeah. um, things that we share, it's sort of, yeah. you know, and he could always and get, really get that. He could always get his wife to laugh, which yeah. was great. You know, I wanted, to, I wanted to ask you, I've been wanting to ask you this about your poem, Beth. Uh, I, or maybe, maybe I already uh, mentioned it to you, but I really see it as a poem that talks to Elizabeth Bishop's uh, mm -hmm. One Art. And mm -hmm. uh, in, in the way that her poem is filled with the loss of things. And your poem goes beyond that. There, in some ways, there are no longer things because words are, are um, the sense of loss is hard to gather around a memory that's fading. Mm -hmm. And uh, so yours is, is, is this kind of beautiful, really mm. um, uh, 
spare notion. It's, it, it really is like the sequel to, to her poem. I don't know, did you have that in mind at all? I, mean, I, I hadn't really connected um, Bishop's poem and this one, but in one art, this loss of things, the memory, the memory of the loss is crystal clear. Right. And so I, I can see how you connect the two because of memory. And I think you're right that here um, you're becoming less and less specific and more and more vague yeah. in terms of what, you know, categories. All of right. a sudden you're in a category rather than in a specific name of yeah. a person or a thing. Um, and then just this idea of a landscape that no longer has... Um, um, is not differentiated. It's just right. getting gray, very gray and very undifferentiated. I don't yeah. know. I guess that could be depressing. I don't know if it is or not. No, I didn't uh, find it depressing. I found it sort of wonderful, actually. <laughs> um, uh, the, the, there was a phrase, vaguely aware, that really struck me, and it seemed to kind of come at something of a turning point in the poem. And just that condition of being vaguely aware, because I think it, for me it added a lot of pathos to the poem because I feel like when people begin to lose their faculties of memory and speech and other things that you know even if, if, if they're not entirely um, with it there is a there's an awareness of a loss that makes it sadder sad for the right. person as they begin to feel um, the loss of it and so I like that the poem never kind of defines what that vague awareness is, what that state is. You sort of, it's sort of, you have to kind of feel your way through it as, you know, as this opening gray kind of broadens. And so you feel like it's changing, right? Um, this, the, the level of awareness may be decreasing even as that things kind of open up into that kind of vague gray. But, um, uh, but I found it really compelling and moving. Um, yeah because you feel like the person themselves, you know, is, is somehow aware. Yeah. I think that vague awareness um, was, mm. I, I saw it in a couple different people, but my father-in-law um, was losing his memory and he was aware he was losing right. his yeah. memory, you know, vaguely aware yeah. he was losing and his it, memory. It so. bothered him, yeah? yeah? It bothered him, but yeah. he also kind of was graciously accepting it at the same time. I mean, yeah. there was more gracious acceptance than irritation. Being bothered. Or... Irritation, yeah. yeah. Um, oh, wow. Wh what, why don't you read another poem? Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, we are all reading about kind of these end stages, so right. maybe I'll read something that starts out um, the opposite, not an end stage. Um, this poem, you, you mentioned the word wonder, and uh, sometimes these little moments in the day, I'll be looking out the window and you'll see the little kids with their parents going past in, in their little cars, right. their little pedal cars. So this poem just came out of thinking about that, how, how they're pedaling down the street. Um, so it's called, They Drive Through Childhood in Their Little Cars. Mm -hmm. Loving them, we love nothing, no one, if not change. As they drive through childhood in their little cars, steering so seriously into the future while we follow a few steps behind, tripping through days and weeks and years, watching as they suddenly speed up without a glance backward, without waving goodbye. Not to grow older, not to grow up. Once safe in my kingdom of cocoa, I wished for that, but years pushed me roughly out the door. I drove away in my little silver car gripping the wheel too tightly, steering so seriously into the future without a glance backward, without saying goodbye. Older now, we know, if we know nothing else, that we love them as they were and are, though what they are keeps changing. We can't keep up. How seriously they pedal their little cars into a future we won't be part of. In a moment, a turn ahead will take them out of sight as we follow, follow for dear life, practicing our goodbyes. 
Mm -hmm. Lovely. David, how about you? Sure, I have a short one that um, we were talking earlier about sort of the dark side of wonder. I, I, maybe this is a little bit of that. It's a short poem called Night Blind. Mm -hmm. There's a spot at the top of the street where the lamp is out. That's the darkest part of the block. I don't go that way at night, though it would be all right, I know. No one's there, just a chained up dog in damp air and branches too dark to see, like black water churning. Mm. Um, so I guess the maybe a sort of one aspect of the dark side of wonder is that just not knowing um, what's out there. Yeah. Uh, and the kind of awe that one feels um, uh, and even apprehension kind of as you look gaze right. out into that. Yeah. yeah. And that dog. Yeah, the, right. It's a little, the there's a little, something a little ominous about that. Yeah. I, I'm going to follow that with the, with the dog. I've got a, a dog. I love dogs and poems, don't you? Yeah, I, I I'm love, big fan of them. Yeah. Big fan of I hope you're going to read the one that it's one of my favorites. It's called Boom Boom. Yeah. <clears throat> I leave my backyard and enter the alley in search of my poetry. I get lost a few houses down near the Eldridges because all the fences and trash cans are identical. I am alone, filling a shirt pocket with the bees David Hills eviscerates by pulling out their stingers, and that he is lined up on a flap torn from a cardboard box that's pinned to the ground with four small stones. In a toolbox, I have a small hammer and screwdrivers for taking things apart. Above me is the sky that is always blue. This means at night the stars are what I see but can't count. The alley is dirt. My shoes scuff its uneven surface. Suddenly, a door opens, a dog barks. It is Boom Boom, a chihuahua, <laughs> not even a dog in my mind. <laughs> It rushes its side of the fence and is so much louder and fiercer than it needs to be. After a while, it stops. Now it sounds like a tambourine because of a collar with tiny bells. Passion flowers grow in a thick vine over Boom Boom's fence. I have been told the leaves of these flowers are the lances that pierced Jesus' chest and broke his legs. Boom Boom is whimpering lying down near a place in the fence through which I squeeze my hand to touch his nose. Boom, boom, I say very quietly, I love you. You are the only one who understands me. Afterwards, I feel very small and very large, restrained and freed and certain there is a purpose to life beyond the one I've been given. I think, mm. I think that that's when the speaker <clears throat> is speaking to Boom Boom, you know, you are the only one who understands me. That just is the very heart of the poem, mm. totally. And it's such a strange moment, you know, this, and, and, and then you talk about being large and small at the same moment. And, you know, you've got the small chihuahua and the large human being and this moment of, of very um, strange wonder. Yeah. Uh, well, strangeness is something that you, you feel at the edge of, I think, a lot of times when you're beginning a poem, but you don't know if you're going to be able to keep it um, sort of alive and active, because mm. you know, quite often you kill the strangeness. Mm. So, I'm, so I'm glad it feels strange. And I think when you get to the, the poem just keeps deepening, you know, it, it, which is what a poem should do. Well, but thanks. I mean, the, thanks way that it ends is perfect. Thank you, Michael Collier, and thank you, David Yezzy. Thanks, Beth. It was a pleasure. Thank you. That was fun. Thanks. Yeah. It was. I'm Elizabeth Spires. Thank you for joining us today on this edition of Hoko Polizzo's The Writing Life. <laughs>
Thank you. 